how do we know what we know about the origins of the universe or the universe in general? Welcome to The Neutral Ground. This week, our guest is Dr. Will Kinney. Will is a professor in the Department of Physics at the University at Buffalo, where he has been on faculty since 2003. Dr. Kinney received his Bachelor of Arts from Princeton University and a PhD from the University of Colorado Boulder. Dr. Kinney's research focuses on the physics of the very early universe, including inflationary cosmology, the cosmic microwave background, dark matter, and dark energy. He has authored more than 70 published research articles and received the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching in 2014. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about his book, An Infinity of Worlds, Cosmic Inflation and the Beginning of the Universe. We discuss the cosmological principle. We talk about the very real time machine that exists today. Things get a bit dark when we discuss dark matter and dark energy. And we get our groove on when we talk about the soundtrack of the universe. Finally, we discuss something from his book that blew my mind, eternal inflation in the multiverse and the realm outside of science. Now, quickly, while we're both still within the realm of science, use your collective atoms to hit the subscribe slash follow button for the podcast and leave a kind comment or rating where applicable. Every little bit helps to support our goal of bringing back meaningful civil discourse. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Dr. Will Kinney. Will, welcome to The Neutral Ground. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, Joe. Thanks for having me on. It's absolutely my pleasure. So we're going to be mostly discussing today your book, An Infinity of Worlds, Cosmic Inflation and the Beginning of the Universe. I have a copy of it here. There. Beautiful. Beautiful cover as well. Absolutely yeah, lovely. I'm very happy with it. It's lovely. Sometimes you'll hear people say, I, I had no input on my cover. Like they'll just add that in and you can tell, okay, clearly you're not happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> but you do, you have a beautiful one. Uh, there's a story there, but I'm not going to tell it. Okay. <laughs> we'll let that become mythology and lore. <laughs> Well, I'd actually like to begin, though, before we get into these these topics here, I'd like to ask you, what led you to the field of cosmology? I, I don't know. I was, I've been interested in astronomy and astrophysics since I was a kid. I was an amateur astronomer in high school and uh, I read a lot of pop science books, right? So one book that was very influential on me that I read when I was in high school uh, was Steven Weinberg's First Three Minutes which was a beautiful summary of, you know, the state of the state of the art in cosmology at the time. Uh, and that, that was one of the big influences on me, I think was, was reading that book and, and actually doing practical astronomy myself with a telescope and, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting into that that way. And so when I was in college, I actually, uh, my undergraduate thesis I did on uh, cosmology as well on uh, primordial gravitational waves. And so that one thing led to another in graduate school and so on, but. It's been a lifelong interest, really. That's wonderful. You know, because I had a similar thing in that I stayed with my field from undergraduate. I wrote my undergraduate thesis on Herman Melville, my master's thesis on Herman Melville, my PhD thesis dissertation on Herman Melville. And so it's very rare. We're a rare breed to, <laughs> to have that kind of connection from the beginning. That, that kind of consistency all along, yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Well, all right, so let's start to make our way through some of these kind of thick concepts here. And I, I want to begin with the cosmological principle. Now, you say in the book that the implications of this principle are profound. What is the cosmological principle, and why are its implications profound? The cosmological principle is really an extension of an idea that dates back to Nicholas Copernicus. Right. So in the pre-Copernican universe, the Ptolemaic universe that was uh, dominant in, in, in European thinking for 1500 years, um, the, the Earth had a special position in the universe. It was the, the center of the cosmos. Everything was you know, surrounded the Earth. And, the, the, uh, and so it had this unique position. And in fact, it was believed that the, the laws of nature that govern the motions of celestial bodies and the ones that govern the motion of material bodies on Earth were completely different. So there was no concept of a universality of physical law or, a, a, you know, and, and, and our position in the universe was 
both special and inferior, right? We are lesser beings in this cosmos that is nonetheless or point, all pointed at us. In, so Copernicus turned this on its head and, and he realized that if uh, one were to propose a heliocentric cosmology, the earth at the, center, the, the sun at the center of the solar system instead of the earth, that you would have to demote the earth from its privileged position into, in, in a sense, an ordinary one. And so the Copernican idea was that the earth is in some sense, ordinary. It's typical. It's one of many planets. The cosmological principle is an extension of this, uh, a modern extension of this that sort of underlies all of our basic assumptions about how we model the universe. And it's based essentially on a universality of physical law. It's the idea that not only is the Earth not special, but the Sun is not special. It's one of many stars, and it's one of many stars and one of many galaxies. And furthermore, the laws of physics that govern motions of bodies on earth, for example, and the, the, the laws of, of the universe that we see locally are in fact universal and they apply everywhere. And it's this universality, this ordinariness of our position in the universe that we have no privileged place that is really a fundamental underlying idea of most of our conceptions of cosmology in a modern sense. And it's, it's infused in the concepts of relativity that we got from Einstein that actually Copernicus was the first, uh, uh, cosmologist uh, to propose a principle of relativity, actually, that was later refined by Galileo and then modified by Einstein. Copernicus realized that in order for the Earth to move, you had to have a concept of relative motion. And so this, this basic concept of our own ordinariness in the, in the cosmos is a tremendously far-reaching and important idea that uh, forms a basis for a lot of our other ideas about how we construct a picture of the universe and our place in it. Something that I love about these conversations is the difference between reading it in the book and hearing you say that it hit me just how heretical it must have sounded, not even just to displace Earth from its privileged, privileged position, but then to go as far as to say that big glowing object in the sky that we know is something grand and wonderful as the sun, even that isn't necessarily uh, important, right? Like they even just the transition from displacing the earth to saying, well, guess what? We can actually even say that the sun has less importance in this, in this idea of position must have been a fairly f big leap to take actually. Well, I, absolutely. I mean, it was, it was really a deeply radical notion, especially since the, you know, the, the, the society at the time was structured really, you know, consciously people uh, argued that the, you know, human hierarchies were reflections of the cosmic hierarchy, right? So this had tremendous implications for organization of society in the Middle Ages and all of these things. I'm not a historian, but I mean, it's quite clear that uh, people like uh, Thomas Aquinas really made cosmological arguments for the ordering of, uh, of things, uh, you know, in, in the natural world, uh, in natural law on Earth. But the, the one of the people who is really the philosophical heart of the book uh, and that I, I actually read a lot of his stuff while I was writing the book is a, a, a man named Giordano Bruno, who was a, a contemporary of Galileo's. He lived in the late 1500s. He was actually uh, burned at the stake for heresy on Campo di Fiore in 1600. And Bruno is notice, notable for extending this Copernican idea far with a far greater reach than even Copernicus or anybody else, any of his contemporaries did at the time. He was really the person who said that the sun, if the earth is ordinary, then the sun is ordinary and there must be many, many other planets like the earth. And uh, so I, I, I have a quote from Bruno that I, it forms that actually is where I got the title for the book. So Bruno wrote in 1584 that God is infinite. So his universe must be too. He is glorified not in one, but in countless suns, not in a single earth, a single world, but in a thousand thousand, I say in an infinity of worlds. And of course, this is where the title of the book comes from. But it was a radical notion. It was, and it was one of the counts of heresy against uh, Bruno, for which he was ultimately executed by the Inquisition. He was in prison for seven years. Uh, and among the counts of the counts of heresy against him that he refused to recant. One was a belief in a, a heliocentric uh, cosmology, and the other one was his belief in an infinity of worlds. So this was a deeply unpopular notion at the time. And it uh, and it's one that uh, 
I think really resonates even today for a modern cosmologist. He was hundreds of years ahead of his time. I was extremely ignorant of Bruno, but I marked that passage in your book as well, that quotation, because I just thought, oh my God, that it's absolutely brilliant. The the construction of that idea, even of the the taking the infinity or infinite nature of of God and then expanding that out, uh, was just I had never come across that before. I, so we we have this the, the loss of this privileged space in the cosmological principle, and that idea alone infiltrates a lot of the different ways that we think about cosmology and about our universe. And we have a kind of romantic vision of the Big Bang as a, you mentioned it as a primordial egg, right? Kind of thing that explodes out. And, and all of a sudden we get from the center, all of these galaxies and stars, except that can't it's really be the way. Yeah. yeah, it can't really be the way, right? Because then that's a privileged space. It's a center point. So if we, if we can't think of it, if we want to maintain that cosmological principle, how should we think about the kind of image of the origin of the universe then? This is a really key point. And this is it's a very common misconception. People think of the Big Bang as an explosion, right? And a better way to think of it is that instead of a place in space where everything exploded outward from, it's really a boundary in time. And the universe, in fact, if, uh, if in fact there is no privileged point in the universe, that means that the universe can have no center and no edge. Or as Bruno put it, the universe has neither center nor circumference. That's another direct, I mean, he was way ahead of his time. And so if the universe has no center and no edge, then uh, it follows that there, uh, that it must extend forever in some sense, right? So that the, this, this implies an infinite universe. And so in order to avoid any privileged position in the universe, you immediately are led to the conclusion that the universe is infinite. There are other ways to get around it. There are closed surfaces that you can do, but let's, let's not get too complicated. And so in the Big Bang then happens everywhere in an infinite space at once. The universe, an entire an infinite universe, hot, dense, and uh, uh, but at every point spatially infinite, pops into existence all at once, and every place is exactly the same as every other place. So the Big Bang is not a position in space, but it's really a moment in time at which this infinite space popped into existence, which is a very different picture from what I think most people have of what when you talk about the Big Bang. One thing that I I particularly love about your book is you do a fantastic job of marrying science and philosophy again in a lot of really interesting ways. So even just listening to you again, talk about that idea, just us, our discussion of this loss of a privileged point, you can't help almost but be a little bit in, in awe of how that might also make someone think differently about life in general. And, and I appreciate those that, that kind of philosophical bend that you have. I, I want to stay for a minute with this beautiful story problem a little bit. And let's take it to a dark place, though. So the Copernican principle mixed with Newton's unification of celestial and earthly motion, right, created this beautiful vision of all space being composed of atoms, right? The, the same particles that uh, make up me and you. And so we become like the stuff of stars except there is a, another matter that we have to consider, dark matter, and how that makes up so much of, of the, the universe or space, I should say. Can you tell us what is dark matter exactly and how, it, how does it differ from dark energy? Well, the answer to your first question is no, I can't tell you what it is exactly because we don't know. <laughs> Uh, but the answer to the second question is, how is it different from dark energy? That one I can answer. So, in fact, the universe is only about 4% ordinary stuff, like regular atoms. All of the rest of it, we don't know what it is, but we can tell it's there by, indirectly by its effect on other things, by its gravity. So, using gravitational effects, we can detect the presence of these other components of the universe, but we have no real idea what their identity is. And it comes in two kinds. So dark matter makes up about 23% of the total energy density of the universe. 
And the other 70 odd percent is in what's called dark energy. Now, the difference between these two things is that dark matter reacts to gravity this pretty much the same way as regular matter does, right? So when you have a little region that's a little denser than its surroundings in the universe because of its gravitational self-attraction that will tend to collapse and more things will collapse onto it. So it's sort of a, this is how structure forms in the universe. It's a rich get richer scenario where over dense regions tend to become more and more dense and these collapse into all of the structure that we see in the universe. This is driven by dark matter. Dark energy, on the other hand, reacts to gravity in a sense opposite in that it doesn't clump at all. It stays completely smooth. And our best interpretation of what dark energy is, dark dark matter could very well be like a, a new kind of particle, something that we haven't seen yet in the standard model, for example. That's one of the leading candidates. So some heavy thing that acts like atoms, except it just doesn't interact with light or with other stuff. I mean, that's, that's fairly easy to imagine. Dark energy, on the other hand, the best idea we have for it, and it's not a terribly good one in a variety of ways, is that dark energy corresponds to an energy density that's associated with empty space itself. So if you were to take a perfect vacuum, eva evacuate the, all of the other stuff out of the space, you would still have this leftover energy density, this, this energy of the space itself. And that has very peculiar properties. In particular, it causes the expansion of the universe to speed up instead of slow down, which is what you would expect from gravity, right? All of the stuff in the universe is gravitationally attracting all the other stuff. So your naive expectation would be that that makes the expansion of the universe gradually slow down. And in fact, that was what people expected to measure in 1998 when they went out and used supernovae to try to measure this deceleration of the cosmos. And what they found, much to everyone's surprise, was that it was actually speeding up rather than slowing down. And this is this, this really smoking gun signature for this weird energy that doesn't clump under gravity and actually makes things fly apart more and more and more quickly. So, so is this quite bizarre. Is this, is this one of those situations where we learned from dark energy that there's nothing and then there's the absence of, of things? In other words, yeah, that they're not so really the is, same thing, like they're very nothing different. Nothing is something and nothing can change and nothing has dynamics and nothing has effects, right? So this is, this is something that's deeply rooted in, in quantum mechanics is that even a perfect vacuum quantum mechanically because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle is full of things, full of virtual things that aren't quite real. They, they don't quite reach to the level of things that you could pick apart and, and, and hold in your hand, but nonetheless, they have very far reaching effects. Uh, and so quantum mechanically, because of this property of uncertainty, you can never completely have an, an absence of anything. There's always a potentiality for something to be there quantum mechanically, and that potentiality has physical effects that you, that you can measure. As I mentioned to you, I, I think before we even we, we even started this, uh, my my field is early American lit and Herman Melville specifically. And you begin chapter three with a quote from Moby Dick. Absolutely. And I have to give you credit because it's one of my favorite quotations that no one tends to use ever. It's this idea of, and I'll just say because it's quite beautiful. He says, there, the ringed horizon, in that ring Cain struck Abel. Sweet work, right work? No? Why then, God, matest thou the ring? This question, and it's beautiful, but it made me think of something as well. You have a, a really quite a, a lovely way of preserving the awe of science and the practical at the same time in this book, which makes it a joy to read. And, and I would like to ask you a question about language here a little bit and limitations. I actually just had on uh, the show Dr. Nick Enfield, and he talks about two realities that I didn't even think was going to connect in this way. Brute reality for him is reality that is not governed in any way by our language. So in other words, our discussion of gravity has no effect on gravity. It's going to do what it's going to do. The social reality, however, is really reliant on language because it's about how we coordinate with each other. So our discussion today, and I don't 
have a problem saying this, is quite limited by my ignorance. Really. How do you, or, or let, me, let me ask it this way, do you find at times or feel that limitation of language to express these observable laws of the universe, even among other scientists? And if so, how do you enact a process to try and overcome that limitation of language with the laws? That's, a, that's an interesting and complicated question. Um, to a certain degree, I mean, it, as, as, as a physicist, the, the ultimate language that you're using for this is, is mathematics. And I think that most of my colleagues, it would be fair to say, view mathematics as, in some sense as being fundamental, perhaps even more fundamental than the laws of physics. We can imagine universes in which the laws of physics are different, but it's very difficult to imagine a universe in which the laws of mathematics are different. And so I, I think that a lot of physicists are very are secret or not so secret Platonists uh, in a philosophical sense. And that when we speak in mathematics, we're really speaking kind of in the language of God, that, that, that this is a language, that this is something that's built into nature and it's, it's something that we're just borrowing, you know, uh, and discovering on our own. That ends up getting you into all kinds of weird places when you start to talk about it. But uh, I, I, to a certain degree, I think that this, this question of we have these physical laws that are that exist outside of us and independent of us, that First of all, that, that, that realization comes from, in a sense, it, it, it owes itself intellectually to the Copernican idea that we're not special, that the laws aren't made for us and that our, and that our apprehension of them has no effect on them, right? That we're just, we're here for the ride. That's a very Copernican viewpoint, right? When you think about it. Um, and so, and, and the universality of physical law, right? The idea that it's the same for another person, even if they speak a different language, you know, some alien is still going to measure the charge of the electron to be the same thing and is going to really deduce pretty much the same, you know, standard model that we do and so on. And, and so the idea that all of these different, any creature in the universe that takes the time to figure out how it works is going to come up with the same answer is part and parcel of the cosmological principle. And if you abandon that, then you have really no solid ground to stand on at all. So the, the practice of science itself really relies in an acceptance of the idea that it's possible for us to uncover laws that are objective, that, that exist outside of ourselves. And that our, 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 the limitations of our language are simply our limitations and our ability to, to comprehend or appreciate that. When you were writing the book, did you have a, a particular moment that you thought, this is a tough one to translate into this comprehensible language, knowing that you're not speaking to just people who have that mathematical knowledge? Was there a particularly difficult section that you had to translate that way? Uh, constantly. <laughs> I thought this is an extremely difficult book to write. I mean, it is a tall order uh, because you're explaining. So, so this is we, you know, uh, uh, talking with my editor and my publisher about the book. The idea was to write a book about cosmological inflation because we realized, you know, uh, when we were discussing the, you know, the, the framing of the book that there really aren't that many uh, publicly accessible books on the subject available. The, the last a uh, pop science book that was really dedicated entirely to inflation as a concept was uh, written by Alan Guth, who's the originator of the theory, the perfect man to write the book. But his book was in the mid 1990s, and there has been so much that has been accomplished in modern precision cosmology since then that I, that's that's applicable. That we really needed a new book, but it is a very tall order. And uh, I, the the joke I tell is that you know my uh, MIT Press. Uh, commissioned me to write a 40,000 word explainer on inflation and they got a 47,000 word manifesto on Copernicanism. Uh -huh. So that part kind of evolved as a, you know, the, that structure of viewing the cosmological principle of the Copernican idea as this undergirding theme of the whole thing was something that developed as a, as I was writing the book and I was really, and, and I was trying to translate the technical language into, uh, into, you know, more accessible language. Um, 
Yeah, I, I think you did a, a fantastic job of that. And I appreciate the fact, too, even though I have my limitations, certainly in this area, I appreciate the fact that you don't coddle the reader. You don't do that. There's a there. It's a challenging book to read through, but in a very good way. I found myself, I did have to go back, reread sections, look at the models. You have great models in there as well that help, but you don't chat, you don't coddle the reader. Uh, was that a, was that a, a decision that you had to make? Yeah. And I, I think that this is something that is different about this book than a lot of pop science writing. Uh, and to a certain degree, it's an experiment uh, that uh, this is this goes contrary to a lot of standard tropes of science communication that have you know have become popular in the last ten or twenty years or so. Um, so there are a couple of equations in the book, for example, and there's the famous quote from Stephen Hawking that every equation reduces your readership by half. <laughs> <laughs> But I, one of the one of the real inspirations for the book was uh, was Steven Weinberg and his style of science writing, and it, it's very much exemplified. So this book is very much an homage to the first three minutes. It's a book on a similar subject. It is uh, and sort of Weinberg's way of doing things really informed my choices when I was writing it. And I have a quote from Weinberg that I think really encapsulate this beautifully. So Weinberg talking about science writing. So Steven Weinberg was, uh, for the listeners who aren't familiar with him, was a Nobel Prize winner for developing uh, the uh, electroweak theory of the standard model and was a, a giant in the field and only died a, a couple of years ago. So Weinberg, writing about science writing for the public, wrote, so it isn't always essential in writing about physics that everything should be made clear to the general reader. What is important is to respect readers, not to fool them into thinking that all would be clear if they were not such dolts or that obscurity is a sign of profundity. And I, I think that really captures the philosophy I was trying to use when I wrote the book, which is don't uh, try to snow people uh, and make them feel like they understand something that they don't actually understand. Uh, and so don't be afraid of the complexity. Try to explain things clearly and simply, but uh, go where the go where the logic of the problem needs to take you in order to uh, in order to do that. And one of the things that I tried to do in this book that is perhaps a little different is really dive into the data. Right, and when you're doing science, you always, always, always have to compare your ideas against reality. That's the heart of the scientific method is that you must test your ideas. If you have an idea that you can't test, it really doesn't count as being a scientific idea. It might be fine philosophy, but it's not science. So I spend a whole chapter of the book really talking in detail about the observational evidence that we have. So inflation, this period, early period of accelerating expansion in the early universe that is the subject of the book, leaves behind echoes and relics in the present universe that we can look for. And in fact, they're pretty hard to find. You have to look very carefully. And I wanted to ground these sort of larger philosophical ideas in data and say, there is a reason that we believe that this is a correct model of the universe. And it has to do with the properties of the universe that we can really go out and measure. And it's an important part of the, the overall picture in the book, I think. And it's something that tends to get glossed over in a lot of popular science writing, I think. Well, that's that's actually a great primer for my next question here, because I, I want to ask in a little more detail about how do we know what we know. But I, I want to connect two ideas from chapter three in your book that I thought were, were really quite fascinating. You write in the book, because light takes time to reach us from its source, we never see the present, but only the past. Now, to this, you add the idea that a telescope, which I had never thought of this before this way, a telescope is really a time machine. And if we had one that was powerful enough, we could see the Big Bang itself with a few problems that, that I think you mentioned in the book. And correct me if I'm wrong here. Let's presuppose we had a telescope that was powerful enough to reach that, that far we would still have to deal with problems such as light, density, temperature, and even the friction of the expanding universe known as the cosmic rest frame. Did I get that right? Uh, sure, That's, that is correct. Okay. So with so many different pieces of the puzzle to overcome, how do we know 
what we know about the origins of the universe or the universe in general? Well, this is, I mean, that's the key point, right? Is that when we look at it, because light has a finite speed and light, we think of it as being so fast, it's almost instantaneous, right? On human scales. But the way I like to put it is that the speed of light is about 10, about 30 centimeters or about a foot per nanosecond. So in the amount of time it takes your cell phone to do one calculation, the chip in your phone to, to do one uh, arithmetic operation, for example, light only travels about that far. Right? Mm. So light is actually glacially slow, especially on cosmological scales. And so when you look out, because this light is traveling so slowly, the further out you look, the further back in time you see. So if you look at a galaxy, that if you look at the sun, you see it as it was eight minutes ago. If you look at the Andromeda galaxy, the closest large one to us, it takes light two and a half million years to get here from there. So you see it as it was two and a half million years ago. And further out you go, the further back in time you see. So we can actually, and an archaeologist has to reconstruct the past from bones and relics left over. But a cosmologist, we're lucky because we can actually see the entire history of the universe laid out around us. As we go further out in space, we're actually seeing the universe further back in time. And the furthest out we can see, at least with photons, with light, is the point at which the universe went from being opaque. The early universe, because it was so hot and so dense, was like a thick fog something where you couldn't see your own hand in front of your face. I mean, the, the, it would have been, uh, and you can't see through that fog. But at, there was a point about a little less than 400,000 years after the Big Bang, when that fog cleared, when the hydrogen and helium gas, which was all there was at the time, went from being ionized with their electrons stripped off to being neutral with the electrons captured by the atoms as they cooled. That clearing of the fog is called last scattering. And what it did was liberate the glow from that hot gas, which was glowing just like any other hot gas would, like the surface of the sun. It was a, maybe about half the temperature of the surface of the sun when this happened. That glow of, called black body radiation from the gas was released into the universe and has, been, and, it's, and has filled the universe ever since. And so the furthest out we can see is this glow that is left over from the Big Bang that was emitted by this hot gas when it went from being opaque to being transparent about 400,000 years after the Big Bang itself. And we have measured this now with exquisite accuracy in the 21st century with satellite measurements. We can actually measure this to incredible precision. These very high precision maps of this light left over from the Big Bang we contain a tremendous amount of information about what conditions were like in the very early universe. And this is one of the primary ways that we test our theories of the, uh, of the extreme early universe is by their effect on this primordial light from the Big Bang itself. So that takes care of kind of the, the light part of this, but something that also I had never really thought of or, or heard of before until your book was that apparently the universe has a soundtrack, a cosmological mixtape if you will, in the form of baryon acoustic oscillations. Can you explain to us the role that sound waves play in our understanding of the universe's kind of nascent stages of development? This is really cool. So in the very early universe, the uh, ordinary matter, what's what we call baryonic matter, by which I mean hydrogen and helium and protons and neutrons and electrons, no ordinary stuff. We call that baryonic is the, is the buzzword for it. The baryonic matter interacts really strongly with the, with the light. And so it's bouncing around and it's bouncing off the photons and it's like a big hot, you know, it's like the inside of an oven or something like that. But underneath that is the dark matter, which doesn't interact with light. It interacts only with gravity. And so early in the universe, the dark matter would have started collapsing into denser and denser structures. But the baryonic stuff would try, when it tried to collapse onto these, what are called halos, these overdense blobs of dark matter, when the baryons try to fall onto it, the gravity is pulling them in, but the pressure from the photons, the pressure from the light is pushing it back out again. So there's a seesaw effect, and it sets up essentially what it does is what the dark matter collapses and touches off sound waves in the baryonic matter. 
because the, essentially it's the collapse of the dark matter halos disturb, disturbs the baryons and they, they try to fall. And so they oscillate and those oscillations of the baryons create sound waves in the early universe. And these propagate out in all directions. And these sound waves we can actually see in the light left over from the Big Bang in this what's called the cosmic microwave background, this relic glow from the Big Bang itself, in that certain certain parts of the universe would have been a little hotter and other parts would have been a little cooler because of the higher density and lower density caused by these sound waves propagating in all directions. And it's these primordial sound waves that we actually see in the uh, in our maps of this light left over from the Big Bang. And the form of the hot and cold spots created by these sound waves is the tool that we use to determine the conditions at the time. And it's very rich. You can measure all kinds of things. Uh, you know, you can measure the curvature of space. You can measure the mass of the neutrino. You can measure the amount of dark matter. You can measure the amount of dark energy. You can measure the expansion rate. All of it is governed by the pattern of hot and cold spots created by these sound waves in the early universe. Yeah, I found that to be absolutely fascinating. I, I loved learning about that, and and I'd never, I mean, I, I, we we think so much about about things like in space, no one can hear you scream, and so we think about the absence of like all sound and thus sound waves, but that's not the case, and that's what I think I found to be so fascinating about that particular chapter is just thinking about sound waves or waves in general, even in in space, it really opened up my my mind to that. Uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's a a really amazing process, and it's been it's really been measured in great detail. Not only in the in the the cosmic microwave background, but you can also see it in the pattern of galaxies distributed in space. So these sound waves would have propagated outward, and they make these sort of ring shaped structures. And it's so there's it, but they're all piled on top of each other. So you can't really see the rings, but when you look at how galaxies are distributed at three dimensions in the universe, which is something that we've only managed to do within the past 15 or 20 years, you can actually see the imprints of these sound waves in the way that galaxies are distributed in space. And wow. it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Yeah, that's amazing. You also talk a lot about, and this is in the title of your book as well. You say cosmological inflation attempts to fill certain gaps in our knowledge, right, of the universe. What is cosmological inflation and, and what gaps is it trying to fill for us? Inflation really is probably best thought of as a theory for what happened before the Big Bang. This gets you into some, a little bit of a strange territory, but it, it, at, at first blush, that's a good way to put it. And uh, the idea is that the standard Big Bang cosmology that we developed in the 20th century, right? Uh, that, in fact, of course, the term Big Bang, you may be aware, was a pejorative that was coined by Fred Hoyle, who believed in an alternative theory, and he was making fun of the whole idea, <laughs> but it stuck somehow. Um, that it's this picture of the early universe being very hot and very dense and expanding and cooling and gradually structure forming and so on. Uh, but this has a peculiar property is, is that you can show if you just plug it, you take everything that's in the universe and plug them into Einstein's equations for gravity and run time backwards and say, what would the early universe have had to have looked like? You find that it had a finite age. And that age is 13.8 billion years with uh, our uncertainty on that number is only about 200 million years now. We're actually measuring it at a couple percent level. The age of the universe. Isn't that cool? Yes. I mean, um, and at that moment, there in the standard picture of the, the Big Bang, Einstein's theory of gravity tells you that there will be a thing called a singularity, which is a point at which the density of the universe actually becomes infinite and the temperature of the universe becomes infinite. And our, our laws of physics, as we understand them, break down. We no longer can calculate anything at that point, right? So when this happens in a physical theory, generally what it's telling you is that your theory is incomplete. That there's something that you're that you're not adding in that you need to add in in order to make this like not everything not blow up. So, um, inflation is an idea that replaces that moment of this initial singularity with the end of an earlier epoch that was very very different from what we observe today. That in the inflationary picture, the universe instead of being hot would have been very cold and very empty, 
and it would have been filled with nothing but this energy of empty space that we talked about when we talked about dark energy, very similar, except much, much higher energy scales, about a hundred billion times as big as we can probe, for example, in the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And this theory explains a lot of things that the standard Big Bang doesn't, which is why is the universe so big in the first place and why is it so old? The time scales that you would assume from gravity would tell you that the universe should begin and end very quickly. So that the, even the fact that the universe has existed for 13.8 billion years is something that's rather remarkable when you look at it in terms of gravity. Uh, why it's so close to geometrically flat, that the space isn't curved like the surface of a sphere, but it really has the geometry is Euclidean. Why is geometry in the universe Euclidean? There's no reason to expect it to be. And also, where do these initial seeds of structure, these little overdense and underdense regions in the dark matter that collapse to form structure, their origin is unexplained. Inflation explains all of these things in a very simple and elegant package that uh, is very closely related to other phenomena in particle physics, in particular the uh, phenomenon of the uh, what's called symmetry breaking in the Higgs boson, which was a particle that was discovered 10 years ago this year. Uh, so the announcement was 10 years ago on July 4th. And so cosmologists have sort of stolen this physics of the Higgs boson and applied it to this other problem in the very early universe uh, of uh, this, you have to have the universe full of this incredibly high energy of empty space that has to decay and end and decay into all of the particles of the standard model and heat the universe up and create the initial conditions for the Big Bang itself that we can, that are well established by experiment now. So inflation is really a theory that tells you what the initial condition for the Big Bang was, what happened at that boundary in time that we were talking about earlier. And if, if that bit of wonder and, and amazement isn't enough. You blew my mind in chapter seven. And here's, here's what I mean. It might actually connect with something you mentioned about the limitations a little bit here of when, um, when, the, when the science breaks down and you almost have to reconceptualize what's going on. Let me, let me give you the setup first here. And then to bring you, I'll bring you in here at the tail end. You talk about eternal inflation and the multiverse in this chapter. And you mentioned that Almost any model of inflation results in the prediction that inflation runs out of control forever into the future, and there should be an infinite number of universes like our own. Now, that's the setup here, so we're all on the same page. I'm with you there. Here's the part that really kind of got me. You say, more disturbing still, the inflationary multiverse lies outside our cosmic horizon forever out of reach of any conceivable observation or experiment. If this is indeed the case, the multiverse lies in a gray zone at the boundary of, or perhaps a little beyond, what can be called science at all. That last line gave me an honest-to-God chill. We rely on science so much for just about everything in our lives. What makes that particular concept potentially outside of what can be called science? Well, the, uh, the key concept here is this idea of a horizon. And horizons are, it turns out, ubiquitous in Einstein's theory of gravity called general relativity. And a horizon is essentially a boundary beyond which you can't see in which the universe could exist beyond this, but it, uh, uh, it's observationally inaccessible. Perhaps something that's a little bit more familiar to your listeners is the idea of a black hole, something that you can't, once you enter it, you can't escape again, right? The outside of a black hole is really a horizon. And the, it, so this is an example of what we mean by a horizon in relativity, that once you're inside that thing, you can never get out of it again. So those of us on the outside can never see what's inside of it, even in principle. The cosmos also has a horizon called our observable universe, which is basically because of this finite speed of light. Because light travels at a finite speed, if we look out in space, we see back in time. We can't see out forever because if the universe is only 13.8 billion years old, then we can't see light that has had to travel for more than that long in order to get to us. So we have the universe itself as a whole may be infinite. And in fact, there may be many, many, many of these infinite universes, as we discussed. But we can only see a little tiny patch of it because of the finite speed of light. And so 
we are stuck in this little bubble. And so about the, a, a naive calculation would tell you that it was about 13.8 billion light years in radius because the light has had to travel 13.8. It's a little bigger than that, actually, because of expect, effects from cosmological expansion. So its radius is around 40 billion light years. Anything further out than that, light would have to have started traveling before the Big Bang in order to get to us. And we can't see it, even in principle. And the presence of this horizon limits our ability to, to say anything about what happens beyond it. Now, in the case of the inflationary multiverse, it's this remarkable thing that you write down a theory that explains all kinds of physical things about the universe, and you can test. And this gets back to the whole idea that the testability of it is key. You can, it makes very specific predictions about the properties of our own cosmos. You can go out and check those predictions. And in fact, we have, and it has passed with flying colors. So it really is a scientific idea. It, it's testable observationally. But then when you calculate its consequences, the universe that it shows you is nothing like the universe that we live in. It is far vaster and uh, in fact, has this property called eternal self-reproduction, where it's constantly popping out new universes forever into the future, all of them being torn apart from each other faster than the speed of light so that they can never reach each other. And this is just a, an inevitable consequence of this theory that you otherwise are testing locally and, and have reason to believe is true. And so that puts the cosmologist in a very awkward position because we are forced suddenly to talk about things that really can't be categorized exactly as science anymore. And of course, this is very controversial among cosmologists and there are many viewpoints on it and there are lots and lots of arguments that take place as to the correct way to think about this. Can I, can I ask you about a little bit about those? Because I, I find... I teach in, a, in writing and critical inquiry. So I teach this idea of the importance of dialogue, conversation. How do you approach, because you, a, a, you have a model in your head. This is what I, what I believe based on the work that I've done, based upon everything that I've taken in, the research, all of that. How do you then approach another professional in the field who has a different viewpoint? What is your process like? If I could ask you to break that down a little bit when trying to engage another scientist and also trying to give them what you believe as well. Well, ideally it would involve a lot of alcohol because I think that would be necessary here. Um, <laughs> That's conference, right? That's when you go to a conference. <laughs> <laughs> so these are conversations that are best had in the bar. Yeah. Uh, so it's, yeah, it, it, and one thing that's striking about it is how different people's viewpoints are on it. And in particular, it centers one of the, one of the big controversies and one that I talk about at length in the book is this, uh, this idea of the anthropic principle. The idea that the universe, the, the laws of physics are so perfectly tuned to allow for the existence of life that it can't have been an accident. And there is there are various ways that you can approach this. And so I talk, for example, about the picture that you get from string theory, where there are many, many, all these different universes would have completely different laws of physics, and most of them would be mute and barren and empty of any, uh, any contents at all, much less life. And that we, our little pocket, our little bubble universe in this larger multiverse is special because it allows for the existence of life. And this is something that I, I feel very uneasy about because it is something that is really in direct opposition to the cosmological or the Copernican principle. In order to accept this anthropic idea, you have to throw away 500 years of you know, philosophical basis for our picture of cosmology and replace it with something really different. And for me, that's a bridge too far. I think that if we abandon a we abandon a Copernican viewpoint on this, so this multiverse now takes Bruno's infinity of worlds and extends it outward into an infinity of universes. And this is one of the ways in which I think Bruno was prescient: is that his his idea just like seamlessly applies to larger and larger scales. So not only are we uh, uh, an ordinary planet around an ordinary star and a ordinary galaxy among trillions in the universe, but in fact, our universe itself is one of an infinite number of, of, of other ones. And it is it, it, in that ensemble, it is itself some, in some sense ordinary. Um, 
so there is this clash of these principles between a Copernican viewpoint on uh, uh, the universe that inflation reveals to us and an anthropic viewpoint, which is a, a, a really a reactionary stance against that idea of our own ordinariness. It makes us special again. And this is an ongoing debate in cosmology, uh, one that probably will never be resolved because, as we've discussed, there is no ultimately no scientific resolution to the problem. It's, it's mostly a philosophical one. So I'd like to move move toward the the close of this by asking you, and and I think this is you've already shown in some ways the answer to this, but I want to ask you more directly: what what keeps you invigorated and energized about this field? What keeps you needing to learn more and keep going? One of the things that is makes it so exciting right now is that. Uh, we are in an epoch of precision cosmology. I, I, we are really in a revolutionary time, and I, and I think many people don't realize how revolutionary it is. And I think it's comparable to uh, back in the, in the Renaissance when Galileo was discovering the, uh, you know, really the nature of the, the solar system. We are doing the same thing except for the cosmos as a whole now. Astronomers are making the first three-dimensional maps of basically our entire observable universe. Um, I was at a talk uh, a few weeks ago where they were talking about a successor to the uh, gravitational wave detectors. You've heard of LIGO, right, that detects merging black holes from their gravitational wave signatures. A planned successor of this uh, that they uh, are looking to build, one of its uh, design features was that it would be capable of detecting all of the black hole mergers in the observable universe. All of them. There isn't a black pair of black holes that could merge anywhere in the universe without this telescope seeing it. That is just remarkable that one could make that statement. That it's like, oh no, we're going to see all of them. Full stop. Yeah. And this is where we are. I mean, and so we are really putting together this data driven picture of how our universe works in an unprecedented way. And Having that data come in and being able to really do hard-nosed science and test these theories and rule things out and, and, and uh, refine your ideas based on observation is the heart and soul of science. And, it, and it, it makes this particular field a very vital and exciting one right now. And it's, it's, a, it's such a privilege and a pleasure to get to be part of it and you know, take a small part in developing these ideas that a thousand years from now people will still know about. Uh, it's 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 really special. I, I think that excitement and that wonder is is built into your book as well, and and that's one of the other things that really resonated with me, um, because sometimes you can tell when someone feels like they have to write a book versus someone who is excited, and I think your enthusiasm really comes through. And again, I I want to say just for my listeners, I, I really do appreciate the fact that you're not coddling the reader. It's tough, but it is really rewarding to read this book and to kind of grapple with the ideas. Will, I, I really appreciate you coming on, on the show and, and kind of sharing this knowledge with us. Can you leave us with any projects you might be working on or ideas you're thinking about and maybe where people can learn more about your work? I think that, well, I would just want to say thanks, Joe, for one thing. This has been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Um, and I... Uh, I've done a lot of writing sort of in a more, uh, at a slightly more technical level, written review articles and things like that, so that there are a number of good review pieces that you can find, for example, uh, uh, on my website. Uh, there, there are a few papers there that are aimed at a slightly more technical reader to explain some of these ideas for people who are interested. As far as more popular science books, I don't have anything in the pipeline right now. I mean, I'm, we've been talking about it a little bit. You know, my, uh, the, the book has been doing reasonably well and my editor is happy. And so that they're, I think they, you know, they're kind of saying, well, you want to write something else? And so we're, we're still formulating ideas on that and we'll see. It takes a lot of time. <laughs> A lot of time and energy. We talk about energy in this sense, but there's another kind of energy as well. It takes Writing a, lot of a book is hard. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Will, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me on. It's been a great conversation. Well, I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Dr. Will Kinney. 
If you did, consider checking out his works using the links provided in the description section. And if you made it this far into the episode, consider hitting the subscribe slash follow button if you haven't done so already. Leave a kind comment as well or rating where applicable. And don't be afraid to share an episode with a friend on social media. Until next time, try to keep one foot firmly planted on neutral ground. And have a great day.